It's probably on my end. Well, there we go. Well, we are. I could hear that. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're <laughs> we're having some issues with um, some audio issues. But as Nelson said, we're just going to jump in and get it all skinned up here. So we're going to see if we can make it work. And if not, then we'll just reschedule and and uh, figure it out. But how you doing, buddy? You're really can quiet. You can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. I hear, I hear you. you. Yeah. So how how are you? Well, I'm I'm doing well, other than getting knocked off of ladders from huge limbs that I'm cutting off my trees. So, what are you doing well. up in ladders, man? Well, Seventy is just a number. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that right, crazy? Now, right now it's also an age <laughs> and i'm feeling it in my back and my shoulder and uh yeah kind of scratched a little bit going down and all that stuff so, you're a madman hey you know you got to be dangerous <laughs> I'm, I'm approaching 50 what's 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 the biggest difference that you feel how would you describe being 70 to your younger self? You can say more aches and pains are just different types because I've always been pretty, pretty active in things my whole life physically, as you have guessed. And so it's just the, the old injuries rather than new ones keep, keep reminding me, <laughs> you know, that's about it. Um, Probably a little less, uh, you know, flexibility than, than I used to have. I can't do some of the things that I used to do even 20 years ago at 50 years of age. But um, but I can still do things that, you know, 99.9999% of the population have never imagined. So there you go. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I, I look in the mirror and I'm just like, who's this? Who's this old guy that's looking back at me, you know? I mean, these, I don't need to read anything, do I? Nope. It, well, if you still there. <laughs> <laughs> so, dude, you're one of my most popular um, <laughs> live streams. You're one of my most popular, most viewed live streams on YouTube, on Facebook. And it's been a few years it's since we chatted glamour. last. My glamour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that smile. Yeah. Your rugged good looks. <laughs> yeah. But not that. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, it's good to talk to you again. And um, what what's that? So, and vice versa. Oh, thank you, buddy. Always, always enjoy the conversations because... You never know where they're going to go. It's, you know, some dark alley somewhere. And <laughs> that's what I like. You know, I'm just, I got a little page here. This is what I write down for my questions that I have. <laughs> you know? uh -oh. Okay. Um, well, and just to see where the conversation goes. But I also, I, I, I've learned a lot from you and I recommend you to, especially new upcoming trainers, but even vetted dog trainers that have, have been through the, you know, been in the industry quite a while. People ask me, especially um, with the Napo Post School or any of my shadows or any, any of the people that learn from me, I make sure that they learn from you as well. Appreciate that. I'm honored. Um, I have to say that, you know, I let me put it this way. You know, what I've taught over the years is not what anybody else teaches. Otherwise, there's no need in teaching it. If someone else, you know, like Bart or others, um, teaches something, why do I want to teach that? They're already doing that, and people can get that from them. Yeah. So. Well, and Bart has, and, and a lot of people about the, with the Napo Post system, they 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 recognize Bart and um, and Michael as well. And the one thing that I found very refreshing about dealing with Michael and and speaking with her 
is the importance that she puts on the relationship and establishing the relationship. And she's kind of the pet side of the equation where Bart did the the competing and, and the precision aspect of it. And it was really refreshing to hear her say that because isn't that what you what you espouse, what you are all about, Nelson? Hold on, you're, I can't hear this for some reason. I don't know what the heck is going on. <laughs> Can, we'll wait for a second because it comes in and out, you know. So if you guys can't hear Nelson, let me know if you can hear him. Then um, let me know that too in the comments down below. But this is the, was the issue that we were having is that I couldn't hear him. Um, nope. Nope, I don't know. There, oh, there you are. Now you're back. Now you're back. Now you're away again. It fades in and out, man. No, can't hear him. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> now we can hear you good. So. Just have to speak in Spanish every time I speak in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> so relationship, that's what you espouse. That's some... Yes, but it's the why behind it. It isn't relationship for relationship itself, although the why is, uh, you know, we are all all mammalian species um, have have this, you know, hundred million year development of similar similar background mutations uh, you know our brains are very similar uh, we have the same neurotransmitters and hormones and chemicals in our bodies and brains the 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 signals come th through our brain in those ways and that's what is our thought and our our being essentially so understanding that pro-social behavior in so in sociality is how most mammals see survival. So on the most base level, having a relationship with another animal is being a partner in survival. And that's the most base thing that everything else is built upon. If you don't have a relationship and that understanding of it, meaning it's your responsibility to provide the right persona, if you will, to that animal to be able to comprehend, understand, and trust you so that you can have a relationship. That's the point. All so right. it's you first. Well, and when we look at, you know, the definition of why, that's our, the cause, the reason, or purpose for which, right? And so, and, and I like how you say it is a partnership because when I was speaking earlier, I was talking about consent and we can consent to be in the same room and not know anything about each other, right? But when you become a partnership, that's when you start to get into the cause, the reason, the, the purpose of why this partnership exists. And so why is it the partnership is so important? Well, so how do you have a partnership? You have to have some, some, you know, modicum of capability of initial trust. And how do you get trust? You have to be able to not just communicate, you have to be able to comprehend the other to trust hmm. consistency, continuity, congruency in behavior and understanding on the outside picture, the inside picture, the smell, all of those things. So you, you know, what I call the six C's and you, you have to, you have to present yourself in a way that animal understands that it can trust at least to the beginning point. So you're always looking for an agreement point. Mm -hmm. tell my, I'll tell my trainers and people who come to me for, for courses, you should be looking for yes a hundred times more than you ever look for no. Why? Because most of the time humans just look for no because they don't want to be bothered with saying yes. 
they expect the other animal to be, you know, in yes mode all the time, looking for that, right? And so having having our minds agreeing with something but never telling that we agree it with it, we just allow it to happen is not the best way to teach or train a dog or any animal or your spouse or anything else. You have to let them know that you agree with it. You're, and, and the agreement isn't you're happy for yourself ego wise and they did something that you liked. The agreement is I'm happy for you. And that changes your neural pathways, your whole meaning and purpose behind it. And it ingratiates yourself to the other animal, whether that's a human, a dog, a beaver, I don't care what it is. If you're happy for that animal, they know the difference in the feeling and they know it in smell too, because of their sense of smell, especially for dogs. You know, I talk about our morphology versus a dog's morphology. And I'm not talking just about the exterior of us. Of We stand on our hind legs and do weird things with our front paws and monkey chatter all the time. What I'm talking about is our morphology is what our brain says we are, what our genetics say we are. And our genetics say we are eye dominant, hand manipulative. Mm. And that's how our brains think that's our that's our entire communication including our languages see here look at this everything is about the eyes not about the nose a dog is a nose machine with four legs that's what the way their brains are structured they're literally structured but through the scent all the rest of their senses their eyes their mouth their feeling their hearing are to corroborate their nose all of ours are to corroborate what we see, our eyes. That's a different shaping of the brain entirely and how we think and try to communicate. So that's the main gap between dogs and humans is our morphology. So they're, they're, we are eye dominant, hand manipulative. So eye and hand dominant. They are nose, mouth dominant. Their tools, their manipulation is their mouth. Okay. And that's the main gap right there, because we think entirely differently than they, they do. That's why you need to get inside the head of the dog. When, mm. I, when I talk about working with a dog, you're working from your brain, uh, a mammalian primate, to a mammalian predator canine brain. That's what you're working with. You're not working with the outside of the dog, what it looks like, its fur, its any of that stuff. You're working with brain to brain. And if you don't focus on that and don't understand the nuance of everything they're telling you constantly, you're behind. And I see most trainers way behind. They miss everything. And I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to sound superior or anything else. It's just what I observe because that is my focus. Well, and you're starting from the conceptual basis of how do we interact with this world? And that would make sense to build a proper partnership. And, you know, my friend David, who owns Scent Logics, he said something that kind of resounds with what you're saying. And, and he says that we as human beings, we're white light chauvinists. Like we have to have, isn't that, isn't that cool? When I heard that, I was like, oh man, I got to use that. And what you were saying about earlier about reluctantly accepting that's a form of acquiescence, right? And so when we use our voice, when we stand firm and communicate in a, an effective and efficient way, that is part of being a partner. That is part of representing yourself, your wants and desires. And we have to respect that these animals also are self with wants and desires, just like we are. And when their we answers, by the way, their answers to the universe are just as valid as ours. They've been around as a species, in other words, as canines, for about 36 to 37 million years. That's a pretty good run. Yeah, and that, and that's their interface of engagement with this plane of existence, with this earth is through their mouth and through their nose. And so 
how do we start to see with our nose and how do we start to explore with our mouth in a way that m might help us understand these dogs better, Nelson? Therein lies the issue altogether. You have to think, first of all, you have to think like a predator, which humans are capable of doing that because we're, we're partial predators. You know, we're about 30, 35% predator. What's happened though, over the past 15,000 years in our, in our history and in, in human history, you know, we've got 200, 250,000 years of, of modern humans, we'll call it, uh, that uh, we have a lot of genetic variations that have occurred over those years. Matter of fact, the reason we are different than the rest of the primates is because of our the actual genetic changes we change faster even in our own life um that's why we have cancers and things like that so much as a matter of fact mm -hmm. is because those ge genetic changes dogs are variable too and i think that's part of why we how we match up we understand some of those changes on a on a genetic level on a genetic memory level so you know how do we how do we match up with them first of all you have to think like a predator and being a predator does not mean that you're out to kill everything it has nothing to do with that um what it what it has to do with is that you look at the world in a different way and the past 15,000 years of human history we created this thing called what that we call civilization and what that is is a grouping of more masses together under understood cultural as much as anything rules that we all abide by generally in initially villages and then cities and then city states and then larger you know nations and all that stuff under these rules that that we either agree to or are imposed upon um depending on what we call government and and those those aspects and so to the point of which there isn't another animal on earth that thinks of globally in other words on this entire planet uh that we are one there isn't another animal or or microbe or any life form other than us that thinks in those terms so what's happened over the past fifteen thousand years from be, being becoming hunter-gatherers and effective hunter-gatherers to what we call civilization, which is a specialization of different functions, is we leave things to others to do for us. And part of that has been our own self-defense. You know, right now, you don't look at your neighbor's fence line as a territorial boundary that is a dangerous place that our neighbor is going to jump over the fence, kill us, and take ours too. We have agreements. Dogs don't know that. They don't live that way. Hmm. That, that territorial agreement is different with them. And, and so we have to think on their terms What's happened is the vast majority of our brain, our cerebral cortex, prefrontal cortex, uh, has gone into culture. So now we think about culture. Our survival now depends upon which shoes we choose to wear and what others think of us, what car we drive today, you know how we look, do I shave today or do I not? That's how we see survival in our society because we've taken out the environment. We don't have to worry about a bear coming down our street. Well, you may have. <laughs> I do. <laughs> but, but generally the population, especially in urban centers, which the world has become an urban place, uh, we don't worry about any of that stuff anymore. So it's the guy across the street that we are concerned about how we survive by how we look and act and wave at them. That's different than that predator, two of them at my feet right now. One of them uh, here at mine. <laughs> thanks. You're still capable of, you know, I describe it as, you know, 
nature is an inconvenience of weather for humans anymore. That's all it is. Instead of what nature actually is. If you had to, you know, 90% of people would be dead in a month if we didn't have all the delivery systems and, and you know, electronics and communications that we have. Yeah. Because they wouldn't know how to survive. And we've lost all that because we've farmed that out to others and specialists to do that for us. So dogs don't have that issue and most animals don't. So that's, that's the issue right there. Now we still have parts of the brain, especially, you know, the cerebellum and parts of the cerebral cortex and certainly the lower brain, you know, the, the medulla oblongata, the, the thalami, <laughs> thalamus, you know, all of those. Amygdala, uh, yeah. yeah. Hippocampus, hypothalamus. Um, yeah. You have all the lower brain, which is the survival I won't say non-thought, but it is the survival brain. It's what happens first. And it is what you use in a survival situation. You know, you're shocked and, and something happens. You're, you don't think about it. Mm -hmm. a, lot of people, a lot of people do anymore because they've never had to use their lower brain to survive on. So yeah. they go to their thoughts. And what does everybody say when go, something happens? It was just like in a movie, which is exactly opposite, because movies are trying to be like real life. So people are so far removed from the nature of thinking in a predatory way, in a self-survival way. They have no practice of it. And so that's the, that's the main thing, is practicing understanding how to view the universe as as it was 20,000 years ago, because that's what these guys think like. And once you can do that, and you have the capability, everybody on earth has that capability of doing that, but you have to practice it just like you have to practice anything else. Sorry for the long-winded answer, but obviously I'm kind of passionate about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I put it while you were talking, I thought about this book, man. It's called... Um, Better Angels of Our Nature. It's by Steven Pinker. He wrote it back in 2011, almost uh, 13 years ago. And he talks about how violence in human civilization has d dramatically declined, even though we might hear about all these these wars and, um, you know, th that and um, that th this is almost like the most peaceful time in our existence because it's been diminishing for millennia and, and um you know, war, slavery, inf inf infanticide, child abuse, assassinations, gruesome punishments were part of daily life, right? And genocide. And um, it, and now because of what you're saying about the understanding in the, evol the evolution of uh, our culture, our civilizations, we have more time to, to contemplate and to ask, why are we here? And and my dog doesn't do that. My dog doesn't, you know, I tell him I go to church or try to talk about Jesus or something. They look at me, you know, like that's, you know, they're not contemplating their existence here. They're not. And that's, and that's what it boils down to is contemplation. Right. And when you're in that, when you're in that lower brain, that that's not a con contempl contemplative place, right? That is fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. You answer when something happens instantly, period. Right. That's your reaction time. And people aren't used to reaction time anymore. It's why I recommend every student to understand, to better understand, for better timing for you, for better health, physical aspects. If you're working with a with a predator, you better be physically fit. You know, especially if you work with larger dogs or ones that have any reactivity or aggression or, or even fear, because they'll pull you down the street on their own. You know, um, you better be physically fit. And and I recommend a high level of some study of some physical aspect. Martial arts is a good one if you can study martial arts because it gives you the physical aspect. It gives you that, that repetitive study of more the brain than the physical aspects of being quote unquote attacked in a controlled situation. So you get used to, you, you actually 
you learn to, as the Japanese say, use mushin notion, which is mind of no mind. Okay. In other words, there's no emotion to it whatsoever. You just, it just, it, you know, somebody punches at you, you just go, it's no big deal. Or a, dog, or a dog tries, tries to, well, it's not even, it, it, it becomes that, but it becomes a, a state of mind. Hmm. It's, it's placid. And the, that's why I say the most, the most relatable thing to a dog is composure because composure under fire means you're worth, you're worthy of following because you don't lose control of yourself. So human emotion is an anathema to dogs because dogs don't have upper levels, what we call learned human emotions. They, they do not. Every study we've ever done, every study I've ever read, they don't have things like jealousy. It looks like it and we project on it. We can see, we can put points together and say, well, that looks like jealousy. So the dog must be jealous. It has nothing to do with that. It's base level emotions of survival that create the same look what humans have done and because of our brain and what we've done with society, that's become an upper level learned emotion hmm. in, in humans. So there's a lot of study of you know neurobiology and, and human psychology and, and actual science, not pseudoscience to suit you, whoever that you is that I'm talking to. Tailored, and, tailored and, to your, uh, to your philosophy, tailored to your system, tailored to, right. If you're doing that, you're just, you're, you're going down a dark path. I'll put it that way. And it's so, going to bite you. It's literally going to bite you someday in the rear end. Yeah. yeah, yeah somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we got some people joining us that I think that you would like to see here. We got John Sparks here. And uh, uh, we got it's still all BS. <laughs> <laughs> you got George. George. Hey, George. Uh, George is my friend. I hope you're doing very well. Yeah, man. I love you, George. He's I see your, I see your uh your four-year-old now uh service dog almost equal to my four-year-old, almost almost four-year-old service dog. I think there's this four. I think that was a gift from God from him, man, because of what happened. And, and, uh, watch it. I watched, uh, your, your, uh, live stream with Mark George, and that was pretty cool to watch. Um, Todd is here. <laughs> he says, amen. John says he only works with tiny dogs that are nice. Now you're getting it, buddy. <laughs> now you're, <laughs> is that why you never smile? Nelson Hodges. <laughs> Look at he's smiling right now. <laughs> Oh, you went away. Hold on. Oh, there. Now you're coming back. All right. And then uh, <laughs> be in control of mood and movement. If you're not in control of yourself, you have no control. Because the only thing you can control in life is how you respond to input. That's it. If you don't have that control... You, you have none. You got nothing. You can't control any other thing on earth. Hmm. How would you tell people? I mean, one of the things that I say, Nelson, is a tip that I give them. And I did this to kids because I just did this um, this presentation on Friday for this elementary school. It was really cool, man. And um, I was teaching them how to approach a dog and... And I was also letting them know, hey, look, uh, our, I, I, I said, you know, we, we're, we're in control of our movement. And even if a dog's coming after you, we don't become exciting and run away from that dog. We become like a tree and be calm and be boring. Because when you're exciting, you're interesting. When you're boring, you're not so interesting. Right. And then I was asking for volunteers to show me with my little skipper key, who was, who was awesome that day. And, uh, the kids start running up to him and I was like, look, I was like, right here, what's he doing wrong? Right. And so one of the, the suggestions I tell people is pretend like you're walking through a swimming pool. 
like you're you're you don't need to be fast you can walk slow and and purposeful and i think you're froze can you hear me nelson i think we might have yeah. there you are did you what was the last thing you just came back you're the whole time oh you could yeah okay good um, I didn't know to, but I did. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, what are some what are some tips that you give people about how to be aware of, like we said, or like what Georgia says, to be in control of mood and movement? What are some tips? Okay, went away. Hold on. Check, check. Speak Spanish, man, because you're, you're <laughs> there. You're you're back. We're French. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I've forgotten about French. Anyway, um, yeah. So that's a good synopsis that George gives, which is literally, you know, control yourself. Um, and and that means your physical, your physiological, and your mental capabilities. Um, you know. First thing you can do as a human is stop all your monkey chatter. So shut your mouth. And, you know, I, I always used to explain to my clients, if you want to learn how to talk to your dog, shut your mouth. Everybody says that now, except they misquote it. Listen to what I said. If you want to learn how to talk, quote unquote, to your dog, because that's the way humans think is our verbal is communication when in fact it's only seven percent of communication even between us so that verbal aspect if you close that down that forces you to learn how dogs communicate between each other so now you're looking for their their information at the same time you're trying to compose yourself and provide i'll say different you know, movement, body position, speed, distance, intent, all of these things that they communicate with very sophisticatedly and very um, completely with each other. And the way they communicate is back and forth. One will signal and the other one will signal, is this what you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they come to a... To a completion of understanding and and that can go up to five times each per second like that the faster you get as those signals and and the retort back and forth the more they trust and respect you hmm. well, that's why i can get with anybody's dog and instantly have a rapport with them and they treat me differently because I'm understandable to that level. And, you know, I'm not at five times a second. I can do, you know, a couple of times a second. But, you know, in course one on online that I'm doing these days, I've had a blast with it because every student on in that course has to provide videos of the exercise. The last five days we meet on that, it's all about them and their videos for each exercise that I uh, show them and then we review everybody's video in each class and I can point out that eighth of a second where they lost their dog I can stop the video go back and say look see this your dog was checking in with you you weren't there boom it's gone and, and they all go oh my gosh yes so it's so literally you've got about an eighth to a half a second to respond that pause that what people think of as a pause in conversation, and that's how I describe where the conversation is. It's not me saying what I want, it's you responding back. But between the two, if you're, there's not a pause, then you responding back had no interest in hearing what I had to say. So same thing with conversing with dogs. So understanding what they're signaling to you, and then you pausing to get the full effect and going okay i'm trying to i'm trying to understand what you're saying to me and now i have a i'll i'll try this response and then it's the back and forth to come to that agreement 
Hmm. That's, that's very important. That's what a conversation is. And unfortunately, humans don't like to have conversations with dogs. They just want to tell dogs what they want. Well, and it's also listening to respond versus listening to understand. Right. And some people already have preconceived beliefs and responses that they have pre-programmed instead of like really, really stopping, taking the second computing, but also taking other factors into consideration. We're guilty of it with with people, man. Hold on. I think it's fitting that that every once in a while you go silent because <laughs> this shows how we got to we got to adjust our communication style. So I'll, <laughs> there you're back. Oh, wait, now you're gone. Hold on. I think if we, we just, oh. okay, you're good. <laughs> yeah, because I said Spanish. Yo soy un caraqueño, ¿sí? Un venezolano, ¿sí? Wait. So, um, <laughs> you said something earlier about, and this is a new term that always, there's always these new terms that pop up in all sorts of industries and things, and you know, it's new speak. And, and one of them was, was the, the concept of, um, I can't remember the, the word that you used, but it's consent, I think, from the dog. It's not about consent. It's, it's about the communication and coming to, to a mutual agreement. That's a partnership. Now we each understand each other and now it's not about i want you to do this and you're going to consent that has nothing to do with it it's where where are you in your mind and what do you need to do to get x in this well, in this place whether, they, whether you're training whether you're going down the road whatever it is you're doing and so it's that toggle back and forth and coming together rather than saying you come to my side so consent is the wrong word because it sets up because as you know words have meaning and it puts in a human mind a certain concept of i'm standing my ground and you have to consent to me that's not it at all it's about actually becoming partners and having a partnership and learning how what What's what is this dog versus that dog? Because they're different. Well, it's like uh -huh. permission, right? That's where like you're permissing something instead of what I what I think of when I hear um, like relationship team is that partnership. Like that is it's not just um, it's not it's not the the permission. It's the actual agreement. <laughs> Literally agreement. And that's what you're trying to do is you're trying to put forth your ideas and the dog says, I'll respond to that this way. And, and so rather than yanking that dog around on a leash or whatever other tool is you got agreement. And now you've got, you've got a partner that's willing to go to, to the death for you. That's mm. the point. And agreement is harmony and or accordance in opinion or feeling, uh, and and that to me just sounds exactly what it is. Is that, that harmony, and 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 where it's not permission, it's just it's it's actually harmonious. And and uh, you as a musician as well, right? When we have harmony, when we have, I mean that it it just it feels right, you know, and and that's where right to the other individual too whether it's a dog or human or whatever else right 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 and, and we don't have we don't have the same roles just like in a special ops team or a football team or anything else i mean the, the tackle doesn't suddenly get behind you know the the, the defensive tackle doesn't set, suddenly get behind the offset offensive center and and take the ball and pass it to the pass receiver because that's the quarterback's job quarterback has his job he's equal to everybody else on the team 
but he has his job and everybody trusts him to do his job just like everybody trusts that tackle to do his job so it becomes an agreement of how we work together to survive better together that's what real partnership is well and how do we work together to survive better based on our intrinsic desires and our innate qualities that we can contribute to this particular team unit society civilization whatever you want to call it and not and, and it doesn't mean that one's better than the other it is what it is and we need to recognize that and and so that we can we can utilize what god has given us to make things that that harmony right make them make that harmonious that what's the other word when something is um symbiotic Symbiotic, congruous all these other things you yourself have to be internally congruous in other words you have to act think respond all of these things in a way that makes sense that aligns that's what congruity means it is alignment self-alignment as well as alignment with that partnership if your ego gets involved in it then you are missing the other part which is the other half of that and i think a lot of people miss that other half because they simply want what they want well that's, and to know that's not giving anything over to the dog that's understanding each other better and that's the partnership that's what relationship means so we did so how did the humans get together i mean that's why i study history uh you know i have a degree in history uh but as well but you know studying real history especially since since the collapse of the soviet union now that now that the world opened up and we got 60 percent of the world that we could study that we never had access to before in history archaeology everything else we've learned a lot and um and in that what we've learned is about somewhere between 30 and 45 thousand years ago we bumped into this sister line of wolf up in siberia that was already about a hundred thousand years separate from what we would call northern gray wolves uh in their own so that animal created itself and that's what we call dogs now and so that sister line of wolf actually two because there was one that ended about thirty five thousand years ago and that genetics only exists of that one the, the main sister line of wolf is what all dogs come from, except mm -hmm. for Siberian Huskies and Greenland Sledge Dogs. And that was this, this sister line that matched up with another sister line that ceased to exist 35,000 years ago. So that created the Huskies. And they're the only ones with different genetics. That's why they behave, think, and act differently. They sure do, man. <laughs> well, but that explains it. Real science, guys. Real science. Genetics, okay? And we know that humans were bumped into that area. We know why. We know how we got into that area about 45,000 years ago. We have all of those aspects now. We understand where we were and why we bumped into them as, as initially observing each other because when you don't when you don't ever see a particular animal in your entire existence until a certain point now you're studying each other and so we happen to be also hunting the same prey and since this was a huge area from literally from spain to the yukon in north america attached by the way by at that time uh what we call the mammoth step across there north of the caucus mountains and the, the tibetan plateau and all the way through europe that whole area is where then humans spread both directions very rapidly very rapidly and that's when we bumped into those animals and those animals then we watched their tendencies they had senses and capabilities that we didn't and of course back then when it was all about survival 
you study everything in the environment and especially ones that are going after the same prey there's plenty of prey out there so it wasn't in necessarily in competition so we studied them and they could they could sense things over that mountain range that we couldn't hmm. and so we'd follow them and we'd find the herd of mammoths or mastodons or you know ground sloths or, or elk or oric or whatever it was out there and then we could go hunt those things take down a bunch of them and then cut up what we could and drag it back to our village wherever that was and the wolves didn't have to get stomped on by these massive ungulates and so they could wait for us to get out of there and then eat the rest of that stuff and then they started following us so we started it was a it was a an equal partnership and we started using each other as partners within a thousand years we had that that bond that symbiosis uh, that harmony that agreement right that perfect. and that's the modern dogs and humans actually assisted each other to become something different and very 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 if we were still the hunter gatherers and we'd never bumped into dogs we would not have civilization like this period. yeah well and i think that it's interesting man we talk about nature and even in that book that i just shared the better angels of our nature right when we talk about nature there's two definitions of nature so we utilize dogs to get to know nature or the the collective um physical world right plants animal landscape other features of earth right and in doing so it changed our nature as far as the definition of like our inherent features um like the characteristics of who we are to, to build our society the way that it is and our culture the way that it is so um i think that that's interesting the two definitions of nature uh we utilize the 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 observation of the how the how the animal interacted with nature to change our nature to be where we are today spanish speak spanish because you're quiet <laughs> okay i'll laugh in spanish okay um I've had the opportunity, I guess you could say, in in uh, some not tourist areas of the world that uh, that I had to work in um, that has afforded me bumping into Stone Age people, hmm. and um, that was fifty years ago at this point, but. Um, they had a connection with nature that, you know, any of us would be enviable about. And they see us as wasting our time at all this other stuff. <laughs> and it really is, in a way, it's all a waste of time. <laughs> so, uh, and they're very happy people they don't want for much of anything at all and they will share what little they have with you happily yeah i remember going to costa rica and i mean other places that i've gone out of the country even today in modern day like you see people that are the happiest that would we would consider you know living in poverty or living in squalor whatever we would call it but the one thing that they have that a lot of us don't is that happiness and and Todd just made a comment about the current gift that dogs give us is to make us present, right? We, where we do have so much contemplation and, and the time through the technological advancements that we have, that we kind of get lost in our thoughts. We kind of get lost in, in our regrets, our fears, anxieties, because we overthink this world. But if we remain present... Uh, like just like he says, if we are worried about the past or the future, we aren't where the dog is. Espanola here. Hold on. <laughs> I think when I talk for a little while, it like might wipe out your end or something. I don't know. I'm starting to see a pattern here, so I'll wait just a second to see if you come back. Not yet. Hello, there, you, there you go. So yeah, we just need to wait a second and then you come back. 
Say that again. I said, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me what to do. <laughs> You're taking up all the bandwidth. That's what it is. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> so being present is the key. Now, dogs, they, I, I think the, is they make us be present. No, they give us the. I, I, no, I'm sorry, not saying not, Todd is wrong, but they give us the opportunity to be present, and that's that's part of the key. Is <laughs> is presence of mind. In other words, that's that's what I mean by that predatory understanding what we're seeing here, indoor environment, outdoor environment, wherever we're at in the minds of the dog. Because if you're thinking about what you've got to fix for dinner tonight or what just happened with your boyfriend, you know, three days ago, you're not in reality. You're just inside your own head. And the dogs that I always had to work with that were horrible behavior cases were inside their own head like humans are all the time. So it was, it was basically a process of showing them what reality was to make them normal dogs again. And I think if people stayed outside of all their own foibles, thoughts, fears, fear, uncertainty, doubt is death to you. It's death to your mind. So that's one of the reasons studying things and learning more and more and more and more helps you to understand the universe, the environment, the nature of things, other beings, all of that stuff. And wishing it was something else is a fantasy. It is what it is. So study what it is. And I think too many people these days uh, stay in their own fantasy and wish it was a different way. Well, like we were saying about the intrinsic uh, desires and innate qualities that we have and that we were born with, we need to know thyself. And some people have a real hard time doing that, of really looking at themselves. And sometimes they they don't like what they see. In modern society, a lot of people don't like what they see and they cover up by puffing up and trying to be important. Instead of trying to be important, do something with yourself. Don't waste your time trying to be important. Actually become important to someone else. Not because you say so, but because they do. I, lo I learned a long time ago, the easiest thing on earth is to say you're great. And the hardest thing is for someone else to say you're great. So... A lot of people take the easy way. Don't take the easy way, ever. It's it's not the right way. It never is. It's a dead end path. I Sorry, know. didn't mean didn't mean to get off in philosophy here, but I, no, it's okay. Actually, we can get... <laughs> yeah, what, what, whatever our conversation always goes like this. <laughs> well, well, I think that there's also enablers out there that's one thing that really really got me was like i watched this I'm, I'm so interested in behavior right and so i watch all these crazy tv shows and that's probably not helping either but i mean they're, they're, <laughs> like my strange addiction 600 pound life we have um this whole gender uh debacle going on right now too and it, a lot of this is enablers it, a lot of it is people agreeing with your delusions and it's not helping. Yeah, that, so uh, agreement, agreement for non-conflict doesn't help in any way, shape, or form. Doesn't help any party in that because you don't learn if you are in stasis. Hmm. So. If everybody agrees, and that's what that's what kills me about modern society is we all have our own 
concepts, ideas, etc. If you if you cut off conversation, we'll say conversation, you will never learn. Well, that's why I do these live streams too, is a conversation, man. Where it goes, we just never know. And to converse, let me see here. Engage in conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so conversation doesn't necessarily mean it, so there's the art of conversation is presenting things your concepts, ideas, information, facts in many different ways so that others can understand some aspect of it or had a I had a conversation with someone else recently and uh, you know, the, the way, the best, what I learned, the best way to teach humans is to present information to change their perspective. And they have to change their perspective. You are not going to, but in the way that you structure things, tell the story, if it changes their perspective on things, it doesn't, it doesn't negate what they already know. It simply makes them review what they already know from a new perspective. They will change their mind if it's valid, if it's not, or if they reject it because they're fear, fearful of what they might find, that's on them. But so it isn't about agreement. It's about changing their perspective. And that way they discover it on their own. I learned, you know, learn human psychology. You know, you don't, you don't, uh, you don't oppose someone else. That's what relationship-based behavior modification and training is about. You don't oppose that animal. You don't oppose your clients. What you do is you utilize their knowledge, their understanding, and you find a point to agree with, and then you build upon that and change their perspective about what they already know in all the other vast areas. Because once you change a major variable, you, all those variables bump to each other and they change on themselves hmm. because they have to, because it has to be congruous in the mind. So once you change the perspective, you just like jiu-jitsu, and jiu-jitsu is about balance. And if you start to offset someone's balance slightly from momentum, it's easier to continue and actually um, accelerate that off-balance aspect. So the initial part is just getting them enough off-balance so that then the acceleration can happen. Okay, so rather than off balancing, we're trying to balance people. So we're actually writing them to or, or trying to. That's what you should be doing as, a, as an instructor or teacher or as a trainer working with a client, a dog, etc. You're trying to bring back balance to them. And it increases in speed towards that balance. That's what you should be trying to do as they go down the line. So the initial shot is that perspective change. And then you provide proof, the why behind those things, not just the what and the how. Don't tell them what to do and, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. You have to teach them, okay, here's the what and the how. That, that's easy. Here's the why. Why does it work? Why should it be that way? That's the important thing about instruction. And, and I will cajole all trainers out there to start working toward the why with your clients. That will help you in the way you think too, because the way your brain patterns, and, and we are, all animals are pattern seeking. If you don't, it, otherwise everything is chaotic and chaos can't be lived in for very long, okay? That's, that's what happens to to prisoners of war or dogs that are just, you know, living in an environment on a chain, on a tree out in the backyard for its life or in a 
kennel or a crate all its life, like in a, you know, like a, like a, you know, one of the dog farms or something like that. That's mm -hmm. that's chaos. That's no sense of control and chaos. You know, a deprived environment, and that even within that, the brain has to seek patterns. And when it doesn't, that's where fear, uncertainty, doubt comes from. So brains are always trying to seek patterns out. And as I explain in my classes, the first time something happens is a surprise. The second time it happens, there's an A, B scenario. Okay, that's A, this is B. So what's the difference? So your brain is going back and forth between those. The third time something happens, now you've got a direction because you're no longer comparing comparison between A and B. You've got C over here. So now you have this line that now we can start defining. So, you know, A may be here, B may be here, and C may be over here. Well, okay, so this was, this was, C was better than B over, over here. So that's the wrong direction from A to go this way. Now we've got C, but now we have three points to compare against. And that's the way brains are looking for that patterning. Okay. It's not mm -hmm. always in a, in a perfect line and, you know, sequential in direction. The first time you encounter something or do something may be horrible. Next time it could be something worse next time better but now you've got patterns that you start looking at and now you can sense directionality and so you're looking for better outcome for yourself obviously always and this is where detrimental things also happen detrimental behaviors and outcomes happen because you may seek an outcome that's only good for you that's why pro-sociality is so important and partnership is so important with a dog or anybody else, frankly. Well, I mean, congruent means agreement. Remember when we were talking about agreement is harmony. Well, the congruent means agreement or harmony and consistent, right? And so uh, incongruent means Latin, is Latin for inconsistent. And I think also- in Balance, for instance. So in balance, you've got a canine and you've got a primate. So the primate takes care of the primate part and the canine takes part of the canine part. And how do you do that without being at odds with each other and at odds with the universe? So in a human dominated universe, the human has to show the dog this is okay. And that's what you do in behavior modification. Okay. Not because I say so. It's because it is okay. Let me show you. This is all right. We can exist here with no problem. So the dog gets that and patterning again. One, two, three. Now the dog goes, okay, I've got this. Okay. And that's another thing that Huskies, when you're working with Siberian Huskies, three times, they've got it. They don't want to do it four, five, six, seven times. A Malinois? Yeah, I'll go after that ball till I die. Keep throwing it. <laughs> the husky goes, yeah, why don't you go get it? Yeah. <laughs> That's the difference. <laughs> well, so, and, and have you seen that video of that husky screaming when they're trying to get him to go to the bath? I see every husky video about 100 times because everybody sends me husky videos. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm the husky guy. You know? <laughs> well, you got a husky there, an old husky, right? Right now. On the face of the earth, right? Hold on, you went. You need to repeat all this stuff because you're silent. I need to shut it. You hear me now? Okay. <laughs> as you as you stay silent, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yes, uh, yeah. Bella, I've had Bella a little over twenty years myself. She was one when she, when she came to us. So she's a little over 21 years old. 
the second oldest husky was a client of mine and a friend has become a friend that I worked with 19 and a half years ago. She's 20 and a half down in Florida. And um, at the end of her life, unfortunately, she's got cancer and they're going to have to put it down. So, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. What's been going on with um, the Institute? Oh, tons, tons. Um, lots of lots of changes since you and I have talked. Uh, you know, I I always ask for feedback from the students because I know what I teach, but I don't know what they learn, and I don't know what they need unless they tell me feedback from it. There's no use in me teaching what they already know generally because they themselves can modify and apply concepts. So that's where need to, I need to have the feedback from them. And, you know, people ask me, you know, well, well what do you teach in this class? I said, well, it's not important what I teach. Why don't you ask, you know, there's a hundred people, a hundred trainers, you can go ask, what did you get out of the class? That's more important. So, you know, they can they can contact lots of those people because they're willing to talk about it. But the institute, you know, is is really it's an educational institute. That's what it's for, and it teaches you, you know, things that you're not going to get out ever ever anywhere else. At least that's what they tell me. If there is something else out there um, that's already good and someone teaches, I don't want to waste my time teaching that. Go to them. Um, as a matter of fact, go to them because as, a, as an industry, we need to come together instead of continually breaking apart into little tiny tribes and saying, we're better than you or you're crap or any of that stuff. That is the most detrimental thing that that we can do to each other. And it doesn't help you. It just makes you look petty and small. So I will I will cajole everybody to stop with all of that. You can learn from lots of people. Learn who to learn from is the key. And it isn't the most popular, boisterous, the guys that that uh, necessarily uh, advertise all the time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, usually the quiet ones on the sideline are the ones you want to learn from in the, in the first place. So uh, seek those out. And seeking is not uh, marketing. So, but uh, the Institute, what we've done is change. The sequence is similar, you know, uh, in if if you wish to pursue a certification, it's not easy. It takes a minimum of five years. And the reason that is, is because you have to go through the courses and it's not, this isn't a dog training school. So it isn't about, you know, going to six weeks of training and then, uh, and then all of a sudden you're a master dog trainer, whatever that means. Um, it's the the certification series is course one through five course six is um an in, invitation only for instructor level but uh, one through five plus some of the what we call the specialty uh, uh, courses are required um and you have to spend a year or so between each one of those courses in order to do basically a practicum so you're, you're not just learning stuff and you go off and you have it you have to learn it and you have to learn it by doing it for eight months to a year so we have a minimum of eight months between each one of those levels that's why it takes four or five six years um but uh you know the people that have done it the certified trainers they're they say it's worth it, so there it is. <laughs> but uh, one of the things that I've changed is what's in some of those courses. Um, 
kind of changed the order around based upon what the students have told me and uh, probably going to add another one in there that will be online between course one and two. Uh, and it's basically going over uh, case studies and analyzing those, uh, which will, should be helpful in, in understanding a lot of things. So, um, but, you know, we have a lot of courses and it doesn't mean you have to get certified or anything else. It's just, um, studies that that go into a number of things you know nose work course uh, leash handling um, you know lost dog recovery uh, you know medical triage there's all sorts of different courses that we have over the years fearful feral dog um, that's a that's a huge one that will teach you probably some of the most important information on what, how dogs think and how to work with dogs of all types because it goes into, you have to understand what they're telling you. You know, I learned more by working with fearful and feral animals than any other dogs, period, because you move, you blink wrong, and from 80 feet, they're terrified of you. So you learn how to present yourself in the right way that you're not a terrifying predatory threat to them. And you become trusted, and that serves you with all dogs. So basically, it's an education center. If you wish, you know, if you wish to pursue it, if it's of value to you and you wish to continue in courses, great. So that's put a link to the to this website. Now I want to talk about something the, that the other the other thing oh, the other thing that we have. Not not from your Patreon thing. It has nothing to do with that. Oh, speaking um, of which. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, stick it up there, yeah. Um, we do have a subscription. It's a monthly, what we call CHRI Live Talk. And I, I pick a, sometimes students suggest or trainers suggest a topic. And it has to be very narrow because I'm not going to talk about broad talk topics i want to, I, it gives me an opportunity to get into that tiny of a subject and go that deep deeper than i even do in any of the, the nine day courses on anything cool uh, and so it, you know like we talked about pilo erection this this month uh and what it means where it comes from the scientific aspects of it all the genetics involved all of that stuff so, yeah, so we, we have a number of subjects over the past couple of years that we've done the, the CHRA Live. It's a whole 15 bucks a month to subscribe on the website. Cool. And wow. there's a link to the website in, in there in the, the comments down below. And um, one thing I wanted to ask you about and, and what I, I love that you have time that this takes to display that you are receiving and processing the knowledge. And one thing I see over and over a commonality in this industry is that people think that they can hop seminar to seminar and move very, very quickly to become an expert. And I just want to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, well, my, I'll, I'll, I'll liken it to a, another subject matter. Okay. It's, it's uh, actually two different ones. So, you know, and other people may know that I'm an architect, licensed architect. That is not easy to do. Uh, there's very few of actual real architects in the world, much less in this country alone. And uh, you, you, the licensure has to be kept up. Um, I had my own firm for 37 years. I closed it in the end of 2019 because uh, I wanted to live longer and the stress of doing architecture at a high level with you know Fortune 500 companies and governments around the world, uh, the timing and expectations with what my other things going on and all that, it was just 
I lived a life of stress without much sleep. I'll put it that way. So I stopped doing that. But, you know, we, I remember back in, when was that? About 1985, I had, I started a firm in Albuquerque initially before I moved to Dallas for Earth area. And we were published in magazines and, you know, architecture books and stuff like that. We won awards all the time. So we had guys, these kids coming from Harvard, uh, interviewing with us for a job, you know, and they would come in and sit down and go, oh, well, okay, uh, you know, I'll do, I'll do uh, construction documents for six months, but then I want to design something. And we're going, <laughs> we look at them and go, you have no concept of what design is. It's not pretty stuff. It's, it's about understanding things in three dimensions and providing space for mechanical systems, understanding structures, you know, the psychology of how people, you know, experience just light itself and how that changes through the day and the season inside of places and, you know, how you control daylight and, you know, all these the myriad numbers of systems, you can't possibly get into that for years. And just because they had a Harvard education didn't mean anything. It meant so they had a good place to start, and that was it. In martial arts, I used to have, you know, I've been in martial arts for 50, almost 55 years now. And, um, they're, they, they're all combat systems. They're not sport. They're not competition. Uh, nothing wrong with those. Please don't misunderstand me, but it's the, the intent behind it is pure combat, um, taking somebody out, but there's an art form of it. And, and, um, I've been in the same system since 1975. And so I would have people coming from jumping around from system to system and school to school and come and take one or two things from, you know, coming into our class for a month or so or a couple of times and then going off and somebody else. And then, you know, a year later, they're opening some school and they have no understanding of the philosophy behind it. They have no you know, behind anything. They just, they have collected a bunch of stuff and they're just doing it and, and it gets watered down and they're teaching people who are going to be more watered down in that way. And that's kind of the way I see seminar goers. I apologize to anybody who enjoys going to the seminars. That's not what I mean, but yeah. And, and, I guess one of the things that I wanted to get away from was in the Institute is it's a set group of studies and they're important. They, they can be used with any other system. If you wish to do that, um, it's not counter to anything as a matter of fact. So other than abuse <laughs> yeah. you know, or idiocy, so, um, but, um, but, you know, I see a lot of people going to seminars and workshops all the time and that's, that's fine. I hope you get stuff. Everybody comes, comes in saying, you know, I, I always ask them, why are you here? Oh, I'm going to put some more tools in my toolbox. I said, well, I'm here to explode your toolbox. I don't want you to have a toolbox. That means you all already have a set mind of what you want in there and what you don't. So if your toolbox is this big and you stick another thing in there, it's only because it fits the way you want it to and you reject everything else. Hmm. That's so, so that's what I see people get into in, in the seminars. Thing. And the other part is the, the cultural, uh, you know, so sociality of it. Of seeing their friends camps people get and that's camps. fine you yeah, know that's fine i mean they're still getting education and things like that please don't misunderstand what i'm saying I'm, I'm not insulting anybody but you're missing a lot by doing mm -hmm. those things you're missing a lot i like what you said about the toolbox i'm here to just explode it it reminds me of like that combat training right if if you 
if you don't use everything at your disposal, including if you're if you don't have the wherewithal, the presence about you to to realize that the, everything is possible any, at any any given time, and that you're only focused on this subset of beliefs. To me, that's that's what the toolbox is 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 this defined belief system that any new information that goes against or is like we were saying incongruent to that belief system that has already been built it's not even going to be allowed to be de- deconstructed it's it's going to bounce right off of that box where there's going to be concepts there's going to be dogs especially those feral ones that are going to poke holes in every single program that you believe in and there's dogs out there that are going to do stuff that dogs shouldn't do shouldn't be able to do i've seen it with my own eyes man like this i don't this is this should not be possible (laughs) so yeah so that's kind of that's what's been going on we have something else in the works at the institute that uh, we're not ready to announce yet but uh it's it's coming up um fairs in a couple of months so well and and i hope that you are passing the torch on this stuff too man because this the information well, as a matter that you of fact, have... yeah as a matter of fact so valerie Irwin, who you, you know yeah she's coming back on here soon too good lady smart lady you know studies a lot great student great uh, great trainer and now becoming a great instructor. So she and Angela Luke, uh, both of them certified trainers of mine as well, and uh, instructors. And um, they are pairing together to do our course one uh, at Valerie's place in New Paltz, New York. And I believe that's next month. Yeah, sometime in May. I don't have the dates in in front of me. I should. Uh, So they're going to be doing that. Uh, You know, got uh, Angela and uh, Angela Luke and and, uh, Kinsey Rising are both. um, They've been for a couple of years now. They've been teaching a segment of uh, course three and course four or course five now. Both of them pair together to teach the online part, which is a after the the in person class that uh, teaches about communication, human psychology, working with uh, clients, things like that. Out of those uh, courses, so uh, you know we've got we've got other people in the works helping us and uh, beginning to teach. You know, they're all they're all quite capable, so. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Julie Hart is also a certified trainer now, um, and she is going to be conducting the Fearful Feral Dog Workshop out in New Mexico, uh, the the in-person part. Uh, I will be part of that as a follow-up on uh, on a Zoom call with all the students uh, after that one's over with, too. Because I've, I've done that four years in a row, I think, three or four years in a row, uh, each year out there. And then, you know, Julie has so much. We have that one online as well, where you can, it's uh, videoed of the years and lots of lessons. And man, if you want to understand dogs and how to work with dogs of any type, that is a resource that everybody should be going and, and looking at that one online. It's recorded and you can look at it. It's about five and a half, six hours of information that's just jammed full. So that, the feral dog one? Yeah, feral dogs are it's like dog training on steroids, man. I mean, it's something that these, these dogs are moving like our domestic dogs are in slow motion compared to those guys. Yeah. And, you know, they're real dogs. They're real dogs. I remember seeing in, in the different countries too, man, like 
as you were saying, these dogs aren't living in their head. Almost three quarters of dogs of the billion or so dogs on earth, almost three quarters of them are street dogs. So. I remember the highway. <laughs> I was driving on the highway and I was counting dogs and I counted 13 dogs just standing by the highway. And I asked the driver, I was like, is this pretty common? And he's like, yeah, the ones that are smart, they know not to go on the, the highway. The ones that aren't, they aren't around anymore. <laughs> I like country dogs here in Texas, you know, they're all over the place just roaming around and the ones that get hit, well, they just replace them with someone that isn't going to get hit. Kind of a, you know, we we think of that as a uh, not real good situation, and I don't either, but that's the reality of it. That's the brutal truth of our, our world. And not only that, but, I mean, even dogs getting shot for going after livestock. And we had someone, we had an incident up here recently uh, in my neck of the woods where somebody got their dog shot and killed. And... Um, Sheriff couldn't do anything. Oh my goodness. Candy. <laughs> Candy. Sweetie. Yeah. Just woke her up. She was down under my feet here. How old? 13 weeks. Okay. She's a mini me to Bosch. <laughs> looks like looks like him almost exactly you know what that reminds me so we talk we talk about us having an agreement with the the dogs being primates versus predator what significance does a dog have from learning like bosch and candy are like to, from pri a predator to predator is that more eff effective efficient um what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> Say that again. Hang on a second. Okay. We've been having this thing where the audio goes out the first couple seconds when after I speak that Nelson speaks, and so I've had to just zip my mouth. That was a very good question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Hold on, we got a comment so, here real quick here. A little testimony from Remy. I purchased a fearful feral dog online course last year. It was wonderful. It even saved me from getting hurt by a random dog that came out of nowhere on vacation. Great information. Appreciate that. Um, that's why I do things is to, you know, I've told people I've done a lot of things in my life and I've made money a lot of ways. So this isn't about making money. I can make money other ways. It's, it's about a passion of mine to try to educate humans to what, what dogs are in the first place. If you don't know what a dog is, you don't know what you're working with. You don't know how to work with it. You don't know the why behind it. So that's really the education. Uh, as far as dog to dog, every dog that I've ever seen understands other dogs better than they do humans. So it's, it's like trying to translate between Old English and Dutch, you know? I mean, it's their same ba basis and background of Germanic languages, but, you know, the communication maybe 5% maybe is, you know, somewhere in there where you can kind of go get the gist of something, but, you know, um the rest of it is all just gibberish and that's kind of what humans and dogs are i i explained to them you know dog understanding and their universe is here and the humans is here and it overlaps about that much and we think we're in charge and that much of the time the dog goes you're an idiot i'm i gotta survive on my own and that's what happens but most dogs are very magnanimous, otherwise they wouldn't exist with us. So the ones in the middle are the ones that most people, most trainers get to train and work with. It's the 
10 or 20 percent at the end that are either severely aggressive truly aggressive not reactive or severely fear, feral fearful etc cetera, etc cetera, that most don't get to work with because they're off they're off the chart and you can learn a lot by working with those types of dogs but yeah don't try this at home without professional help <laughs> you know well, so don't, don't the, the have dog, dogs inherently understand other dogs much better than they understand humans and they are a better teacher um because they're more efficient at the comprehension between each other so yeah that's why i always had a large pack uh you know average eight up to 12 dogs of my own when i bring in other dogs because they would influence and and working with my individual dogs it took me as much effort and and time to teach them for rehabilitation as it would for search and rescue for life and death stuff or explosive detection took just as many years to teach them each one of them what i wanted of them and how they should behave in each and every case for everything we were going to encounter uh, it's not just throwing a bunch of dogs together and and hope for the best so a lot of effort a lot of a lot of time and once you have the the team established with the dogs your your current dogs it's also a a good feedback loop of any new dog that's coming in too of how they respond to them absolutely i mean once once they once they once my dogs understood what i expected of them how to behave etc the new dog coming in was treated as a pack member instantly and so understanding other dogs better they would look to my dogs for what's the answer here and so seeing that my dogs look to me for the leadership for the answers for the things to do together that dog just inherently came into the pack and so it behaved as a pack member because survival says you know i'm stuck in this with a bunch of wolves i'd better act like them otherwise i get attacked and eliminated which is nature guys so you know that's that's the 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 beauty the weight of having truly balanced dogs and and understanding what the goal is so they had their role they knew it each one of them knew their part in it and so you know it wasn't them keeping the peace it was me keeping the peace hmm. because it wasn't up to them to correct other dogs they could on minor things if it was an immediate hey you know we don't do that around here but as me going for them as that predatory mind of hey you're not going to do that here that's not what we do let's go do this instead because it's not about stopping them it's about showing them what is acceptable we're looking for the yes more than we're looking for no yeah it's just like uh george was saying earlier um trust through clarity right showing them yes, but verify <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but yeah. verify yeah but and that doesn't mean that you're a pushover and i remember when i was out with my packs i would do large pack walks and so, like other dogs that we would encounter they were like oh my goodness this is a, is a group this is a club and i'm not a member like and they didn't mess with us man in fact they would be they would avoid us they'd be like oh shit, that's a lot of that's a that's a lot of congruence or you know that's a that's a pack that um it, it's like that strength in numbers thing right is that that is a strong unit right there and i'm by myself so i'm not as as strong as that interesting was yeah for for years you know i would go out with my pack and you know i'd have you know 8 12 15 21 dogs with me and and we'd be you know walking along a trail and a couple two or three loose dogs would come and you know they'd start barking and lunging and all that stuff towards us and i'd get all my dogs behind 
behind me and I'd step forward and on those dogs' faces was amazing because every time it was like, holy crap, that human must be real powerful because everybody stepped behind him. He's coming at us. He's the predator. They don't encounter that a lot with humans, not emotional, coming at them as a predator going, no, that's not what's going to happen. They're used to encountering dogs and that's what they want to encounter. As soon as that human steps up, they go, whoa, that wasn't expected. So contrast is clarity. It, pro it helps provide clarity. So contrasting, in other words, giving a different answer or a different response always makes the brain think. Because if you, if you get a different response than what you've always gotten, if you get the same response, you've, you've already, basically you're, you're, you're going to those known factors that you already have an answer for. So there's no thinking. It's just a response, right? Yeah. If you give an opposite response, that's how I always work with, with severe case behaviors, you know, severely aggressive dogs that wanted to kill me or kill my dogs or whatever else, you know, or, or ones that were just terrified beyond terror and, you know, would hide over in the corner and I would go over and hide with them. <laughs> Instead of be the you know the opposer, they're going. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> or the you know or the dogs that you know. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to gut you. And you just go. I'm bored. <laughs> and they go. Well, wait a minute. And then they start the barking starts going high pitch, and I just smile, going, "Yeah, I got you now." <laughs> they call their bluff. Yeah, because they they get a different, an entirely opposite response, diametrically opposed response from what they they're used to. They have no answer, so they have to stop, pause, and think. Okay, now I'm going to test what's a better answer because they want to survive. It all goes back to survival. Everything goes back to how that animal sees survival. Every every answer that you can ever come up with, every question you can ever come up with. How does that dog see survival? Yeah. Well, once they start to, I mean, just like Matt says, don't look for what you can wreck, look for what you can reward. And and I wait for them to be, to come around and, you know, start to, to act a little bit more confident. And then you, you got to know that that is a weight of the world coming off their shoulders, man. They're just like, oh, wait, okay, cool. I'm safe. They're cool. I, I feel like I belong. And I'm like, there's where I reward and be like, yeah, you absolutely belong. And it's good to have you good to see this part of you. So as a, as a social animal, that's what dogs and that's what humans are. We, we try to fit in. That's where different cultures happen in different parts of the world. There's different cultures. It has nothing to do with the country, the religion, the anything you can mention it's the cultural agreement of behavior that's how you fit in um and that's what happens with dogs if they see a bunch of powerful animals all behaving in one way they try to fit in and that's what we try to provide a we try to provide the best possible pro-social way of showing animals how to live together with humans yeah because they don't get a choice as to who they live with that's that's part of the problem that's one of the big problems that we have in selecting our dogs that we like because they look a certain way because we're eye dominant not not how they smell <laughs> i want to say hi to ian real quick what's up buddy hope hope i've been praying about you or praying for you and and hope all, everything goes well with you, man. Oh, he's been going through some stuff. Buddy, it gets better. It gets better. Say that, say that again, Nels. As you get toward the end of life, you know, I mean, I've, I've been around for 637 years now, and I may only have two or 300 years left. <laughs> As you get closer, <laughs> things change. It's, you know, it's just... Don't sweat the details anymore. <laughs> You're just happy to be alive. Trust me. Yep. And you don't care what people think. Not much. <laughs> <laughs> 
I remember this back when I was um, I was talking about the pack walks, and I remember there was a couple dogs. This this dog on the left here, Milo, and he was super reactive. Some of these dogs were super dog reactive, and um, man, this was a long time ago too. Look, we get wrapped up in the little pole. And just kind of moved together, and and the the little dogs were getting trampled by the big dogs, so I I separated them and had them go into their own th their own space just so they can feel comfortable. Uh, shark head. <laughs> <laughs> hey, oh, hold on, no, here. Look, <laughs> tranquil. <laughs> Let me shut off this. There we go. It was in my ear. Um, Todd calls that little guy or that little girl Bosch 2.0. Sweetheart, um, she may be leaving sooner than later. Um, I was going to try to develop her for three or four months, but she may actually go earlier. So, no, I'm not adopting her. She's not. She's not a Bosch. <laughs> so, what's one more dog, Nelson? <laughs> no, that's, that, she's she's not that's not what i'm working with everybody was very uh suspect at me working with another puppy but no that's not what that's not what it's for i'm actually experimenting around a bit with her so when there i mean um We've been chatting for a bit here. What what are the best ways that people can get a hold of you? And and um, do you know do you know Dr. Ravi Iyer? Have you heard of this Atlas? He's um he's got this supplement for dogs, especially older dogs. I've not heard of that. I love it. I love it. It's good. I mean, I've I've tried it out with my dogs, and I've heard some great testimonials. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, but I did a live stream with him uh, a couple live streams ago, and uh, yeah, great guy. And and I love it when I find a product. The thing that got me about his product is that I was uh, trying it with my dogs, and it changed the smell of their breath to actually something that wasn't as foul and that just kind of tells me something on the inside is is doing better than it was <laughs> but now <laughs> I, I teach a canine digestive system course understand what dogs actually need and uh you know down to the milliliter and percentage of things so um and one of the things that i that i talk about is that 70 percent of your immune system is what you eat so of course anything that you ingest that's better for you that actually has the right minerals and proteins and everything else is going to help that immune system, especially around the teeth and the mouth. So, yeah. You know, whenever you brush your teeth, that's the only time that we're washing our, our own skeleton. <laughs> well, not the only time for me, but <laughs> <laughs> I've had a few things. I've been able to see inside my arm before and other places. So, yeah. I'd be on the floor, dude. Well, um, I look forward to uh, that thing that we were talking about here in a few months. It'll be interesting. We'll, we'll see. Yeah, Are you, yeah. I assume you're coming to conference. Yeah. Yeah. So IACP conference tickets are on sale, you guys. Let me put up a link. Thank you for reminding me. Um, I think it's IACP dogs now, right? <laughs> We're going to find out. Nope, that's not it. Dogs, plural. Yeah, and then you just got announced to be one of the speakers. Yeah, it'll be actually a, a nighttime 
session and rather than rather than me standing up at a podium and and you know monkey chattering we're actually going to do exercises with the dogs so it's uh eight to ten thursday night which is the first night uh, officially and uh you know anybody that has their dog people who don't have their dog come and watch but uh, it's basically it's, if we're gonna we're gonna I, and I've got a bunch of my trainers that are that will be there to help people individually. So we'll break up into small groups so that you get individual uh, help on each one of those. So we've got two hours, which isn't much time, frankly, when you're trying to teach something. Uh, so we've got two hours to to work with uh, people individually with their dogs, and um, uh, so. I'll talk a little bit. We'll explain some things. I have some video to to review, uh, but otherwise you're going to be working with your dogs. So I hope you know those that are that are bringing your dog to conference, come on out. There's nothing else going on that night, so. <laughs> yeah, well, and I'll be in your neck of the woods too, so you can show me around. I might stay a few days extra too, and. Um... Yeah, I look forward to just seeing everybody. I haven't been to a conference in a few years. And um, I put up a link, you guys. That, that there's a discount on the tickets before May 31st. It's in uh, Dallas, Dallas or Dallas-Fort Worth. In Fort Worth proper. It's, it's in the... Um, what they call the the museum and entertainment district it is a huge huge complex we've got a small part of it that we're that we're renting iacp is renting so uh but it's a massive area and and if you've never been to fort worth you'll be very surprised at how sophisticated modern safe clean fort worth is Dallas gets all the the uh, attention, but Fort Worth is the place where families live. <laughs> so, cool. yeah, yeah, I look forward to just coming down there and checking it. Out. I've been to Dallas a few times. I was just uh, in that. Air I've been to that airport a ton. Me too. I designed about a third of it over the years. <laughs> really? Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Stockyards are the best. Todd says. I want to come down there and have a Texas Twinkie. There's a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of good food here in Texas, especially especially barbecue in Fort Worth. Man, some of the best anywhere. Period. So, yeah. Well, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you? To just go to the um, CHRI website and hold on. HRI website, yes. Um, that's you know my my email is on there. It's it's Nelson at chrinstitute.com. So that's that's the that's probably the best way. So well, awesome, man. Thank you so much. As always, this has been a good conversation. I might tap you once you get a proper microphone and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> to do maybe a patreon exclusive with me where we do um get into some nitty-gritty once we have that event planned too we might talk about that i might just tap you in june or something i know you got some maybe some time available then but um ouch <laughs> <laughs> but i appreciate you man and you guys nelson fills in the gaps of their knowledge base uh, through these different philosophies and theories and he speaks about the importance of establishing this relationship and not just how and you know i mean it's it's in and and what but like he was saying the power is the why and remember the why is our cause reason or purpose for working with these dogs Well, thank you, Bill. I have enjoyed it thoroughly. Uh, you know, rambling as we do, but I, I love I love the uh, the country that we uh, cover. 
<laughs> yeah, no kidding, man. And it's, and I actually like that we had this little glitch that we just worked through it. We didn't get skinned up too bad, I don't think. <laughs> I hope not. Hopefully not. So. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. We'll stay there, man. We'll say goodbye to everybody here. And if you like what I do, you guys, check me out on Patreon. I'm saving up to buy a laptop that's like 2600 bucks and i got just over a thousand bucks so help me over there if you can um i do appreciate everybody that has supported me on patreon and um the reason for the laptop so i can bring i could actually take a microphone over to nelson myself and sit in the same <laughs> <laughs> and, and then make sure the sound level everything's good so it'll just help it'll just help out everything man so <laughs> up over there check me out on um youtube please subscribe to my youtube channel and um and nelson you stay right there buddy we're gonna say bye everybody thanks for watching <laughs>